Welcome to For the Record. I'm Deirdre Bolton. Gary Parr's role as an advisor to the world's key financial institutions is undisputed. When his client Bear Stearns needed a bailout, it was Parr who placed the call to J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon. As deputy chairman at Lazard, Parr has engineered many financial rescues, arguably more than any other banker in the world, from Lehman Brothers to Fannie Mae. I sat down with Parr to talk to him about what Wall Street will look like when the credit crisis is over. There will be four to seven major financial institutions that will do wholesale business, investment banking, corporate lending and such, on a global basis. And will be successful at doing it. Uh, that's still necessary. Um, we're currently in a period where a lot of companies are retrenching into their countries and are becoming rather nationalistic. But in two to three years' time, the, there will be that handful that are global and global providers in access and capital. There also will be a whole group of specialty firms that are beginning to grow and will likely be a lot bigger in two to four years' time, specializing in uh, from giving advice, advisory business, to risk-taking enterprises that will take risk that it used to be big institutions could take and likely won't be able to take as much of in two to four years' time. So you don't see a division between big equaling boring and then specialty being able to take risk. You think there will sort of be a mix? The large firms will have to take certain amounts of risk just for the markets to work. Uh, when Whether it's doing corporate loans or doing other types of uh, business, capital raising, there's a certain amount of risk they have to take. However, um, one of the big changes for all of these companies will be regulation. There will be a lot more regulation on financial services when we're out two years, three years. Um, I'd guess we're actually in the very early stages of regulatory increase um, today. Uh, so many governments have been just simply dealing with fixing the crisis that they haven't had much time to get around to re-regulating. And uh, so early days, so the institutions that are doing what they're doing are going to be facing a very different landscape of regulation. Speaking of regulation, I mean the U.S. government has mm -hmm. stepped in in a way that is unprecedented. Yeah. Do you think in two years or three years we look back and we say the cure was actually worse than the cause? Like right the no. And, uh, I'm, uh, I feel very confident, in a sense, living through last year and seeing how the capital markets froze up, the credit markets just weren't available. The governments had to step in, not only in the U.S., but in a number of other countries. So if governments hadn't stepped in, the problems that faced the financial institutions were way beyond what the private capital markets could deal with. We got involved in this matter because we were asked to help prevent a Bear Stearns collapse that had the potential to cause serious damage to the financial system and the broader economy. But we wanted to help, and I believe we were the only firm ultimately in the position to help. We know you personally had to put off a vacation, right? To help yes. with the Bear Stearns yeah. acquisition. Well, I was with Bear Stearns and I called Jamie Dimon uh, to, to uh, enlist their participation and their help, yes. Talk about confidence, because most people that I speak with say, honestly, this is the only thing that matters. I mean, when does confidence come back? How do you see risk appetite now versus, let's just say, six months ago? Yeah, the, uh, it's certainly we're in a much better position today than we were six months ago. Through the fall, all the way into March of uh, 09, uh, the, the markets and individuals in a lot of capacities were risk-averse, skittish, and not certain where the bottoms could be. The Lehman bankruptcy uh, scared a lot of people, and appropriately so. They didn't that seemed know. to be the straw that broke the camel's back. It really back, was honestly. an important uh, point in time because the U.S. government allowed Lehman to go bankrupt, and the second-order consequences within the first two weeks were substantial. With that happening, the capital markets, investors, managements, and others really couldn't calibrate. Where's the, where's the bottom? How, how do you calibrate how much risk there is? turn the calendar forward uh, to within the last two months, really post-March. Governments around the world, but including the U.S. government, have signaled now we're playing with a safety net. Governments will step in. Governments will protect. So, for example, when the U.S. government did the stress tests on the 19 institutions, they said these 19, we will test them, we'll see how much capital they need, but we will not let them be insolvent. And that was a really important message to the marketplace, that um, there will be a backstop, there will be protection, at least for the institution. didn't necessarily mean the stockholders, 
wouldn't be diluted or what the implications, but there wouldn't be bankruptcy. So from where you sit, you see clearly that a page has been turned and we're sort of into greener pastures. On the one hand, yes. Things are much better. The environment is much better today than it was in the latter part of uh, 08. Um, if you look at, in fact, the market's responding. Uh, the spreads in, in a variety of the debt markets have tightened up. The equity markets have rebounded and it's working. Notably, actually, we've arguably have crossed an inflection point. Um, in the fourth quarter and the first quarter, fourth quarter of 08, first quarter of 09, uh, there was about $650 billion of capital raised by financial institutions worldwide. The vast majority of it had to come from governments. Private money wasn't available. Now in this quarter, uh, about $100 billion has already been raised and 85 billion out of 100 is coming from non-government sources, including sovereign wealth funds are back. The public markets are in. Uh, which to some which, could be a surprise because some of the sovereign wealth funds really, quite frankly, got burned with yes. their investments in U.S. banks. Yeah, the early investments by sovereign wealth funds uh, back in early 08 uh, did almost, without exception, did poorly. Abu Dhabi, who invested in Barclays in November, have sold uh, their position at a gain that was in excess of 50 percent. Mitsubishi, who invested in Morgan Stanley uh, in November, uh, $9 billion, uh, are still an investor and will be for a long time, but the conversion price of their common is below the current stock price, so they're actually in the money on their investment. So people are actually now making money if they came in in the latter part of 08 or in early 09. That makes a big difference for confidence. But indeed, I'd say the other, because people are concerned and still cautious, they're therefore raising capital. When the, given the markets are there, U.S. commercial banks have raised $85 billion um, since April 1st. So they, on the one hand, they may feel reasonably confident about their balance sheet, but the just-in case, they're raising money to provide cushion if there's another downturn or more losses. Gary Parr says that people are cautiously optimistic that the worst may be behind us. But I asked him if he was concerned about what dangers may still be lingering on banks' balance sheets. From what we see, certainly we'd say that there are hundreds of billions of losses to come. Commercial real estate, credit card, and then some number of other mortgage markets in other parts of the world uh, are still coming through. Spain, Germany, some number of those countries. Roughly since the crisis began, financial institutions have lost, now we're just at about one and a half trillion of losses that have been recognized. Uh, a lot of people have different estimates on ultimate losses. So there's still quite a lot in the system where there will be losses. It'll be damaging to the balance sheets. Uh, but we may have again hit that safety point where the markets will provide the capital to replace the losses or earnings will cover some amount. Indeed, uh, there's a lot of profitability in these institutions. Some number have an air of caution that this could turn back against us. It's not a sure thing that the markets are going to hold and be confident. It's a great thing that uh, there's, again, now the ability to access capital. But a lot of people, having been through the prior year, recognize things can turn on you negatively very quickly. Do you think it's an oversimplification to say something like uh, credit cards are the next subprime? I mean, they can't possibly represent the same size exactly. that we saw with the mortgage meltdown. Don't think so. I mean, credit cards are so connected to unemployment. So anyone's guess can be whatever they think about unemployment, but credit card losses tend to track unemployment. And I hear a number of economists suggesting that unemployment doesn't peak until early 2010. So that's some distance away, which suggests there could be quite a lot of losses between here and there. PAR's clients include the governments of Sweden, Belgium, Germany, and the Netherlands, all still reeling from the global financial crisis. We spoke about the challenges facing the policymakers in these countries. Banks located within a number of countries have uh, sustained sizable losses. The governments have had to step in. And now they're trying to figure out how to stabilize their financial system. And interestingly, one of the dilemmas is while the EU is one overall market uh, on many measures, the banks are national and nationalistic. The governments have to do it country by country. The EU doesn't really so have a big central bank. So some people say bank. there's no way to control monetary policy in a unified way. For the way. entirety of the EU. They, they, they can set certain interest rates, but when it comes to rescuing a bank, they can't do it as an EU. They do it country by country. 
And so that is creating some dilemmas and, and no doubt some friction uh, between different countries as to who has strength, how are their institutions uh, within their country, and there's a bit of a nationalism to be sure to protect. Is it all about the proportion? I mean, with Iceland, I think that's pretty much the worst case scenario, that's an right? Extreme. You had yeah. sort of the banking system as really the primary driver. For the, for the economy. Right. Now, other countries, as you said, that's an extreme, but the UK um, seems to be in the same way, almost a disproportionate amount of the banking system represents GDP. The countries that I would include that are affected by this particularly badly would be Ireland, uh, the UK, just Belgium, exactly. Ireland was downgraded as a result of their banking system. Belgium has been downgraded as a result of their banking system. Um, Spain has had exposure and again banking system so you see some number of countries where in fact their banking system has caused downgrades which of course has not been the case for the US. Canada and Australia have often come up as two examples of hey this is the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that and if so is there anything the US can borrow from their system? Certainly those two countries have held up better their banking systems have held up better. I think probably it's more a function of how the managements ran the institutions, how much risk they took. Um, it's not so much a body of regula regulation, as I understand and, and have a reasonably good familiarity with the uh, regulations that are there. I think it's more just what managements did and the amount of risks they were willing to take, and indeed how they stayed, tended to stay, more local to their markets. They didn't expand and diversify. A lot of banks that got in trouble had hit by having exposures to subprime, U.S. subprime. And so the Canadian banks largely stayed in within the Canadian market. They were careful in their diversification outside. Same was true for Australia. So is there a, a local is good lesson here? There, if your country remains in good shape, there is. Right. Uh, and if you happen to be in a country that's turning uh, badly, so for example, again, the German economy, the, the Irish economy, those are going badly. So those banks being focused local is actually harmful. Depends on where you are. Poor risk management was a big part of the breakdown in the U.S. financial system. Parr says he hopes the concept of risk will be institutionalized in the future. To the extent regulators go pursuing a variety of things to regulate, I'd almost hope they focus on risk. That that's a perfectly logical thing to, to learn from the past and, and recognize there should be regulation to limit risks and the, the volatility around institutions in the banking system. So in that sense, institutionalized is a regulatory matter and is a much more aggressively monitored matter. Absolutely, that will be the case. The risk, maybe I'm using the wrong word, but the fear one could have is that regulators go after a lot of other secondary or sort of related but not, actually not on point to risk, um, whether that's compensation plans or a lot of other um, aspects of regulation that may pop up. How is that going to change how the average Wall Street worker, for lack of a better word, is compensated? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think it will relate m more to the composition uh, and the construct of uh, the compensation. So there will be an increased orientation towards equity as a part of compensation, vesting arrangement so that someone has to own the stock for an extended period of time, and possibly, particularly as it relates to the trading parts of the business, clawbacks. I mean, we've actually even seen with outright fraud cases that it's hard to do clawbacks. It, it is. It's very hard to structure. But certainly the notion that aligning people's interests with the health of their enterprise, which tends to be around stock, uh, is surely a good idea and will likely increase and become even a more fundamental part of the compensation on Wall Street. So that if indeed there are real losses, you could actually lose a component of your equity base. That's certainly being discussed. Um, that's awfully hard. I was just going to say implement. that's a very hard line. Very and hard, hard to, to implement. implement. It's hard to actually, even if someone said in theory it's a good idea, it's very hard in practice to construct and make it fair. Because it is important that, that an employee, if they're at risk, that it's something they influence and they participate in. And that's hard to do. For Lazard, recuperating from the credit crisis is also difficult. This year, the stock is down more than 10%, underperforming the S&P 500. In the first quarter, the firm posted an unexpected loss on costs related to job cuts and a decline in deals. Revenue from advising on takeovers fell 42% as companies worldwide completed about a third fewer deals. On the other hand, revenue from advising on restructurings and bankruptcies almost quadrupled. 
Lazard has advised on more than 80 restructurings and was advisor on 13 of the top 25 U.S. bankruptcies since January 2008. I asked Parr if Lazard's business strategy is transforming along with the financial landscape. We'll always be doing advice. I, it will shift as to where the markets are. So there's still a period where, just as a general matter, with um, credit losses continuing, bankruptcies continuing, restructurings continuing across a lot of industries. A lot of investment banks, including ours, will spend a lot of time in that side of the business, and that's where a lot of our advice will go. But once the market's then stabilized, we're already seeing that now there's a need to be involved in advising about raising capital to fill the holes. And then within 12 to 24 months, we'll be back doing more traditional mergers and acquisitions once confidence returns to the executives and true stability for an extended period in the capital markets. Does this change at all when you recruit who you're looking for? Not by much. Um, we really are always looking for the best and the brightest and people who uh, have the ability to think about finance, capital markets, and to, to give advice um, and experience for senior people that may want to join you know, our firm. It really is based on that you know, experience and judgment, and then people figure out how to give good advice, whatever the environment. To what extent has it been easy to, to hire your dream teams now after this whole credit crisis, let's just say, versus three years ago? I think I'd say that uh, for specialty firms generally, uh, there has been this opportunity to see that it's a more stable place to be, uh, that not being involved in balance sheet risks and exposures, certain bankers now recognize the appeal of being in a firm. And for those people, then it's much easier for us to attract them because it's all the more obvious as to what the platform benefits are. Now, you mentioned, obviously, that the M&A business, many people involved in mergers and acquisitions want to know when it comes back. And this doubles back to that confidence question we were talking about. But people want to know, when do we begin to see the average CEO have confidence that a merger can be executed and have good results within three years? Many times, um, looking back historically at cycles, it takes several quarters, at least, of stable markets and, is, and a reasonably good outlook about the economy, at least some idea of how bad, if it's going to be a recession, how bad it might be, uh, or indeed if it's beginning to turn up. So a few quarters is usually necessary, and uh, both in, the, again, this stability notion. So that would suggest it's sometime into this year, latter part of this year, maybe it will be important to go through year-end for a lot of companies to actually see how did 09 shape up as they head into 2010, how would they feel about their business? How do they close out their, their the year uh, to feel confidence? I would say there's another sector of merger activity that we're already, again, seeing begin to pick up, and that is companies that because they're feeling the pressures of a weak economy, they need to consolidate in order to achieve economies of scale. And so sometimes, in fact, their downturns trigger a certain type of merger activity. But again, usually people have to have some eye on how bad is it going to be before they move. So that's, that may be what will be happening even in the third and fourth quarter of this year. In one measure of confidence, we did see a merger announced. Uh, we have Barclays, or BlackRock rather, buying Barclays Investment Group, $13.5 billion. That's a pretty sizable deal and does seem to show confidence, as you alluded to, at least in the financial services. It does. Uh, in fact, we, Lazard, uh, are advising Barclays, assisting them in that transaction. So I would uh, say, one, is we're delighted by that, but two, I, to your point of confidence, it shows it in several ways. First of all, an industry that is a consolidating industry. Someone now view, takes a view they can, get a, they can understand the parameters of risk and price it. The second is that look at the capital that's coming in to support it. And uh, it shows confidence, again, sovereign wealth funds are part of the investor group that are supporting this transaction. And Four or five months ago, that would not have been possible. Uh, there were no sovereign wealth funds um, uh, for transactions that were mergers to support those. So now we're seeing signs that in good transactions that are strategic and longer term, there's capital available. And That's this is very now going to be the biggest money management firm. I mean, they yes. have more money to manage than the Fed. As the, so I hear. So you hear. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do you see any growth areas that you think, bar none, 
you know, going back to the original M&A idea of combining in strength. I mean, a lot of people talk about green energy. There's still tech companies that seem to be innovating right and left. Do you think that these are the ones that get the most press from where you sit? Are you in agreement with that? They get. Those are some interesting areas, and those are areas that need to be transformed and will change, and the, because of the change of technology will cause change in corporate construct. It is likely, however, as a percentage of the overall activity, financial services, which normally represents around 20 percent of merger activity or restructuring activity, it's quite likely that will continue to be very high because we have another wave to come, and that is governments have to exit. And so all of the government ownership, the investments that have taken place, somewhere in the not too distant future, governments are going to begin exiting. Indeed, in the U.S., they've already begun as letting banks pay back TARP just within this time frame. Um, but it's going to be more interesting as they start to think about exiting the common stock and the ownership positions. And that's even a bigger issue in other countries than it is in the U.S. This recession was not caused by a normal downturn in the business cycle. It was caused by a perfect storm of irresponsibility and poor decision making that stretched from Wall Street to Washington to Main Street. So our most urgent task has been to clear away the wreckage, repair the immediate damage to the economy, and do everything we can to prevent a larger collapse. We had a financial system that was very damaged. Uh, banks were weak could not raise equity, we're not able to lend because of that. Our financial system is a great strength of the American economy, does a great job of financing innovation, but we need to do a better job of making it more stable so the crisis cause less damage. Economic and financial weaknesses have fed on each other as a declining economy has exacerbated credit losses and the resulting pressure on banks and other financial institutions has constrained the availability of new credit. A well-capitalized banking system is essential for the revival of credit flows that will underpin a sustainable economic recovery. The credit crisis has cost banks one and a half trillion dollars. In the past two years, Parr's strategic expertise has put him in the trenches. I asked him if he is confident that the government has a solid exit strategy from its unprecedented intervention in the financial system. I think it's still too early to tell. Uh, what all the government policies will be. Uh, so it's a bit I'd be guessing or speculating. I do have dealt with a lot of the government officials in the U.S. and I think they're smart, capable, and very well-meaning on trying to get it right. Uh, the markets aren't there yet fully for the real exits. Um, but again, the fact that they're allowing institutions to exit TARP is a very good indicator that th truly what they said, and that is they don't want to stay in these companies, they're acting on it. They're allowing companies to exit. They're setting guidelines and rules uh, on, under which people can exit, but they are encouraging it to happen. And uh, so I'd say the right indicators are there. Being a top deal maker keeps Parr busy enough, but his 25-year interest in classical music drew him to the New York Philharmonic. Parr, who is highly sought after by nonprofits, was recently elected chairman of the board there. really excited about being a part of one of the great uh, cultural institutions in America, certainly indeed one in the world. The Philharmonic not only does in New York, but travels the world. Sure. And so um, you know, the, the musicians are the best and the brightest at what they do. And that's really and exciting. And this is a lifelong a interest as well for you. That's it is. Sort of I do. I've listened to the music um, ever since I was old enough to listen to the music. So part of your role, part of your responsibilities with the Philharmonic as chairman will yes. be? Overall strategic direction and, and uh, thinking about things including fundraising, but also how to uh, bring in more sponsors, how to uh, show the programming might change over the years. Alan Gilbert is coming as the new music director, which is very exciting. The first native New Yorker okay. to conduct the uh, New York Philharmonic in that its 168 exciting. years. And it is, a, is it hard, do you think, overall to find more money for the arts, music included, in the recession? It sure is. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the cultural organizations are feeling the pressure. So that's creating a squeeze just as it did in the corporate world. 
is now happening in the uh, philanthropic world. So you're going to have a challenge in your private time as well. A little well. bit, okay. yeah. There will be a challenge, but it will be so much fun. It's oh, okay. so exciting to be involved in that type of organization. Barr has attended the Philharmonic ever since he moved to New York and says he listens to classical music all the time. His playlist includes works by Mozart, Tchaikovsky, and Mendelssohn. His top picks, Mozart's Requiem Mass, Tchaikovsky's Fifth and Sixth Symphonies, and Mendelssohn's Third and Fourth. Parr credits his father's knowledge and enjoyment of classical music as the inspiration for his interest. As a banker and a music aficionado, Parr understands the pressures of the financial crisis and its second order consequences as well as anyone. Donations to the arts have declined amidst the worst recession in a generation. The New York Philharmonic has been somewhat spared from the general decline in arts support. The organization's budget remains healthy, rising to about $66 million in 2008 2009, from $63.4 million the previous year. With Parr's international contacts and enthusiasm, classical music lovers will no doubt continue to see the New York Philharmonic as Parr describes it himself as the best. For the record, I'm Deirdre Bolton.